I'll wait for another minute. Okay, I'll start. So the topic of today's lecture is a survey of a three-dimensional QCD. Yesterday, I uh, reviewed the salient features of uh, four-dimensional QCD. And today, we'll see some of the novelties that appear in QCD in three dimensions. I'll present to you what's known. Uh, I mean, I, I'll present to you what's definitely tr known, what's known to a large extent, uh, to, to a large degree of confidence, and what's uh, basically a conjecture. So let me start by quickly recapping the abelian case. In the abelian case of U1 level K, topological field theory. So now I'm just discussing the topological field theory, uh, namely the Lagrangian K over 4 pi I ADA that uh, we studied uh, yesterday. So for this topological field theory, we said that for even K, there are K anions. For odd K, there are two K anions. And their braiding phases, if you take the anion labeled by Q and you braid it by and you braid it around the anion that's labeled by Q prime, you find the phase e to the 2 pi i q q prime over k. And these anions are called abelian anions. That's a very important notion. Because if you take two such anions and you just fuse them, you get an abelian algebra. So you fuse two anions with, with labels q and q prime, you get the anion q plus q prime. And these are, this is essentially... This is consistent with all the braiding phases and, uh, and so on. So these are abelian anions. Now, you might, you might anticipate that uh, there are extensions of this topological filter to non-abelian groups, such as SUN or UN, and then you get non-abelian anions. So before we study the dynamics of QCD in three dimensions, we have to prepare ourselves and study and just learn the few basic facts about this non-abelian theories of anions, because this is going to be crucial for the discussion of the second quantized theory, as you may uh, anticipate. So I'll start by uh, telling you a few of the most important facts about the non-abelian theories. And most notably, the idea of level rank duality, which is a mathematically correct and rigorous statement that I'll review now. And then once we understand the non-abelian anions, we'll introduce dynamical, we'll make the anions dynamical, as we did in the abelian case, by introducing matter fields that could become light, and they would fluctuate, and then we'll have a very interesting uh, discussion about the dynamics of these theories, including generalizations of the fermion-boson duality that we encountered yesterday to the non-abelian case. So before I commence with this plan, are there any questions about uh, yesterday or the day before? Any leftover questions that need to be addressed now before I start? Okay. So let me start. So the like so there are two class there are two theories that I'm going to discuss. SUN level K, topological field theory. Let me define this theory. So SUN level K topological field theory is a non-abelian Chern Simons theory. It has no dynamical anions. It's just a topological field theory, just probe anions. And the Lagrangian is given by I, K, over 4 pi. And then the action is given by trace of A wedge DA plus 2 thirds A cubed, where A is an SUN connection. As before, k needs to be quantized for this theory to make sense. So k needs to be an integer. Okay? So this is also a topological field theory. It's exactly soluble. You can compute its partition functions on arbitrary three manifolds. Just a second. You can quantize it on the torus. There is a Hamiltonian. And if you want to learn about the quantization of this theory, there are beautiful papers from the 80s which have solved this theory completely, even though it's, it seems like an interacting theory because of the cubic term, but it's exactly soluble. And most notably, 
uh, the paper where this theory was uh, first solved is the paper about Jones polynomials uh, by Edward Witten. Edward Witten. Jones polynomials by Witten. And then there is a huge amount of follow-up work digging deeper into this uh, theory with various boundary foundations and whatnot. Okay, yeah, there was a question. Uh, the DA is the, uh, you can write, you mean how to write it in components? This is shorthand notation. This is like a wedge product. You know what's a wedge product? A is a form, is a one, A is a one form, yeah. DA is a two form, and there is a wedge product here. And similarly, A cubed is a shorthand notation for uh, the wedge product of A with A with A. You might think that this wedge product vanishes because A is the same one form, but A is a matrix of SUN. So it just induces some commutators. You can write it in, uh, I'll just write it in components loosely. So the first term is something like mu, epsilon mu nu rho, a mu d nu a rho. That's the first term. That's the shorthand notation in the first term. And the second term is epsilon mu nu rho, a mu, a nu, a rho. But here you need to stick a commutator. Uh, and then you take the trace. That, that's what this stands for. Okay, so this is a topological field theory with anions, but unlike the U1 level K topological field theory, it has non-abelian anions. So the braiding matrix and the fusion rules, the fusion of anions and the braiding of anions are more complicated. They are described by some matrices, and it's not so easy to compute these matrices, even with nowadays technology. It's an algorithmic procedure, but it's not so straightforward to implement. Okay. So this is one class of non-abelian topological filters. And the number of anions in this theory is some binomial coefficient. So there is a large number of anions for generic N and K. So this is one, uh, one uh, model, one topological filter. Another topological filter is UN level K. Topological filter. Okay. Uh, is it still visible if I write down here to the people in the back? Good. So the Lagrangian for the UN is essentially the same. It's just that the, the trace is now in UN representation, so there is also something on the diagonal. And um, uh, the gauge field is the UN gauge field, but it's the same formula otherwise. Okay, it's the same formula, but A is now in a UN uh, matrix, and K, uh, UN connection, I'm, UN uh, connection, and K is an integer, as before. Okay, so uh, so these are topological filters which are exactly soluble, and they describe some uh, probe anions with some braiding and fusion phases. And between, the, since these are just topological filters, uh, the statement that I'm gonna make now can be proven mathematically, it's not a conjecture. It's a duality between topological filters, which is called level rank duality. So while these theories seem different, there is the following duality. U n level k is exactly the same as the S u k level minus n. This minus will be crucial. Okay, to, you remember from, this is why I emphasized yesterday that the theory with level k and the theory with level minus k do not need to be the same. They're related by time reversal symmetry and they're generically not the same. So un level minus k is not the same as un level k. So this is why this important, this minus sign is important. So this equality is a duality. It's a non-trivial duality, uh, but it's not a conjecture. Since these are topological filters and we can solve both sides, uh, this is an exact fact. Okay, this is a mathematically established theorem. Yes? What I mean by exact is that this, uh, these are topological filters. So the content of this theory is, is a matrix for fusion of anions and a matrix for bindings of anions. You can compute the matrices on both sides and they agree. They have the same number of anions, there is a one to one map and the matrices agree. So this duality is, is not a conjecture. It can be proven. 
Okay? I'm not going to attempt to prove it here. I won't be able to in, uh, in real time, but um, you can find the proofs have been given in the 80s. Yeah? Is the same proof for the other groups? Yeah, the, these dualities are not sparse. They exist for orthogonal groups, uh, symplectic groups, uh, even for exceptional groups. Yeah. And then there is a bunch of sparse dualities that nobody has been, you know, nobody worked out the full set of dualities. But for example, recently there was a very interesting paper by a, a Cordova, Omori, and perhaps Shu Heng Shao, but I might be confusing the third author, where they found a bunch of sparse dualities that do not like extend for generic rank and level. All of them are proof or are yes. Uh, well, there are many cases that are open, but uh, I mean, for example, if you look at exceptional groups, then oftentimes we don't have a good dual description. So there are many cases for which there is no clear dual description. But the cases that have been claimed can be easily proven, typically. If you find the right, the right duality, it's not so hard to prove. It's just an algorithmic, it's typically an algorithmic thing to prove these dualities. Okay? Um, yeah. Uh, same number of anions, correct, yeah. In particular, the number of anions in these two theories is the same. Notice that this is called level rank duality because the level and the rank are swapped, obviously, under the duality. If you have seen cyborg duality, it might remind you of that. Um, this is a two plus one dimensional duality, though. Okay, so, uh, this is an important fact to remember uh, because we will use it soon. So let's uh, talk about QCD in three dimensions. Uh, QCD in three dimensions has uh, uh, many differences with respect to QCD in four dimensions, and I want to tabulate uh, these differences now. So let's write the most general Lagrangian. So QCD3 for me is just SUN gauge theory with some fermion. Okay? And uh, since we're in three dimensions, I'm also allowed to add a trend Simon's term, which is a new thing that did not exist in four dimensions. So we have an F squared. I'm being uh, sloppy with the coefficients because they won't matter. So uh, there is one over, uh, let's say, two, or let's say typically people put four G squared, trace F squared, where F is the connection for an SUN gauge field. And then there is a, and then there, there are fermions, side dagger d slash psi i, psi i, and then i, and then there is a mass, psi dagger i, psi i. So we have a kinetic term for the fermions, a mass, and we have a term Simon's piece. Okay, this is the term Simon's Lagrangian for SUN level k. <laughs> it's probably easy. It's probably easier, easier to just write it down. <coughs> so we have i k over four pi a trace of a d a plus two thirds a cubed. So now I want to uh, discuss a little bit this theory and tabulate uh, the differences between this and the four dimensional story which I reviewed yesterday. So Let's uh, make a few remarks first. The most glaring difference between this and the four-dimensional story uh, is that um, there is a new parameter k. There is no analog of k in four dimensions. So the dynamics of QCD, which in four dimensions depends mostly on uh, the number of flavors here, would depend also on k, which is a, a, new, a new parameter. Another very important difference that uh, some of you may already have noticed is that in four dimensions we had psi and psi twiddle. These were the u quarks and the, uh, and the anti u quarks. However, in three dimensions, quarks are non chiral. There are no wild fermions in three dimensions. And so there's no point in having psi and psi twiddle. So there is only one psi. In, in more concretely, in, th in three plus one dimensions, the spin or psi and the spin or psi dagger do not sit in the same representation of Lorentz. One is a half comma zero and the other is zero comma half. But in three dimensions, there is, a no, there is no chirality and the spinner of psi and psi dagger sit in the same representation. So there is no notion of psi and psi twiddle. We just have one sequence of psi's. So i going from one to an f 
and they're all fundamental fermions. We don't need anti-fundamental fermions because the psi daggers are equivalent to psi and so that's it. There is no notion of chorality. They're all fundamental fermions. This is another difference from four dimension. The last difference that I wanna bring your attention to is that uh, in four dimensions, uh, the symmetry of the generic theory at non-zero mass was S, U, and F. But then if we put n equal mass to zero, the psi and psi twiddles don't talk to each other and we get S, U, and F times S, U, and F. Here, since there is only one sequence of fermions and since the mass term is invariant under S, U, and F, the mass term doesn't break any continuous symmetry. And so the symmetry is S, U, and F either if the mass is non-zero or zero, it doesn't matter. So S, U, and F is the global symmetry both at zero, both at uh, zero m and non-zero m. So there is no enhanced chiral symmetry because there are no chiral fermions, okay? Uh, so S U N F times U1 baryon, I should say. These are the continuous symmetries of the model both at zero m and non-zero m. So unlike you said in four dimensions, the point m equals zero is not completely well defined. In four dimensions, the point m equals zero is defined by having an, an enhanced symmetry, while in three dimensions, m equals zero is not a special point for generic A, okay? So these are the most uh, important differences. And now we have to do the exact same thing that we did, um, the exact same thing that we did um, for uh, the abelian uh, particle vortex dualities. We have to I try to understand the phases of this theory as a function of the mass, as a function of K, and try to see if we can guess an interesting duality. Okay, so it's like the same kind of guesswork, and then we do consistency checks. If we land on our feet, we publish a paper. Okay, so there is one more fact that I need to remind you of uh, before we get into the analysis of these models. So the fact that I want to remind you of is that remember in the abelian fermion case, there was an interesting concept that the conductivity jumped by one unit when we crossed the massless point. This is an important fact to remember. There is a generalization of this for non-abelian uh, non gauge theories, like this one, and I want just to tell you the fact. Uh, how does it work? So similarly to the abelian fermions, when you change the mass, the sign of this mass from being very large and positive to being very large and negative, the effective churn Simons level gets uh, renormalized, so to speak, or uh, is shifted. So I'll just give you the formulas. Uh, they are uh, computed, I think they're computed in the same paper of Redlich from 85 or 86 that I cited yesterday. And the formulas are the following. So the K that you see here in the Lagrangian is not the K of the topological field theory in the deep infrared limit. Because integrating out the fermions leads to a shift due to a one loop diagram. And this shift is one loop exact. So the K that appears in the Lagrangian is not the K of the actual topological field theory that you measure in the infrared. It's not the K of the TFT in the infrared because of the one loop shift. And this one loop shift is exact. And this is a one loop, this one loop shift is exact. If you want to see the proof for why this one loop shift is exact, there is a beautiful paper from the 70s uh, that is like essentially a one line proof uh, by Col well, Coleman and Hill. They give a very nice proof that it's one loop exact. Yeah. Meaning that these diagrams, uh, for example, would not lead to a more complicated. I'm going to tell you, you have to measure the K in the infrared. K in the infrared is some uh, number. The question is, how do you compute this K in the infrared using the Bayer Lagrangian? You should think about it as the Bayer Lagrangian. And when we go from the UV to the infrared, typically we need to sum over all the loops, all the quantum corrections. But for some specific quantities, the answer is one loop exact. Namely that if you manage to compute the one loop co contribution, you don't need to proceed further, okay? 
the, red, the rest is just exactly zero. If you want to understand why it works, there is a very beautiful paper from the 70s that proves that. I'll give you, a, I'll give you another proof in a second. Uh, the, the, this proof that I'm gonna give you uh, has appeared uh, uh, more recently. Uh, I won't give references because it might step on somebody's foot, somebody's feet. Uh, okay, so um, the formula is that K of the actual physical topological field theory at long distances is given by K that appears in the Lagrangian plus the sine of the mass times a half. This is the image, this is the, what am I doing? Times an F. This is the answer. Hill, H-I-L-L. So Coleman and Hill have given an explicit perspective argument showing that all these diagrams cancel out. It's a very beautiful technical work. I'll explain to you in a second why this must be true uh, from uh, just general considerations without any computations. Okay, yeah. Yes, it's very similar because if you go from positive sign to negative sign, K jumps by uh, an F. So you see that K of the infrared theory at M going to infinity minus K of the infrared theory at M going to minus infinity is given by an F. And this is very reminiscent of what we found yesterday or what I told you is true yesterday for the billion fermion, okay? Uh, essentially, with these ingredients, you can start working. You, don't, uh, you just need to learn where this comes from, and then you can start, uh, you just need to review this one loop computations once in your life, and then you're, you're, you, 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 you can start uh, thinking about this, uh, this topic. So let me now uh, draw, draw a consequence from this uh, formula. What do we know about the effective K at long distances? If you're an effective field theory person, you ask what is the theory at long distances, and you say that it's given by some chern simons theory with some level k uh, infrared, okay? Uh, this better be an integer, because topological field theories with a fractional k make no sense. So we draw a conclusion that k infrared must be an integer, and this implies a small constraint that will be important to remember on uh, the bare k and an f. And you see that what it means is that if an f is even, if an f is even, that means, sorry, uh, even would mean two, uh, two n. If an f is even, that means that k in the bare Lagrangian must be an integer. And if an f is odd, that means that k must be an odd number. Sorry, a half integer number. So how would I write a half integer? K is a, 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 an integer plus a half, okay? So this is a, a trivial fact that follows from this formula and from this constraint on effective field theory. This, by the way, explains Coleman Hill, Hill theorem in one line because uh, if you just think about it for a second, the thing that's special about one loop diagrams is they, they come out to be independent of G. Now, the two-loop diagram would have additional factors of the gauge coupling G, just by virtue of the fact that the vertices have G. And so, if this was not vanishing, then there will be corrections here that depend on G. But then there would be no way that it would be an integer. So, if something has to be an integer at long distances, it must be exact at one loop. Uh, otherwise, it, it could never work. So, for the consistency of this theory, we see that the, the higher loop corrections must vanish. And Coleman and Hill show it explicitly in their work. Though it doesn't need, I think, an explicit demonstration because it would make no sense otherwise. Okay. Yes. Fantastic question. I was hoping this would not come up. You, you can complain, you can complain that let's say an F is odd. So you can complain that the Lagrangian that I wrote has an, has an 
has an, uh, a fra half integer quantized k, and therefore the Chern Simons uh, part of the action makes no sense. The, like the Bear Lagrangian makes no sense. So the long distance theory seems fine, but the Bear Lagrangian makes no sense. So here there is a discussion. The, the answer here is the following. The answer is that I have chosen a formula for the shift in k, which is symmetric with respect to m going to minus m. This I've done so that it's easier to do computations in your head. But the proper way to do it, the really proper way to do it, is to choose this formula to be, uh, I'll just make a parenthetical remark. Uh, the really pro correct way to do it, which avoids this difficulty, is to choose the formula to be k e ir equals k plus nf for positive m and k i r equals k for a negative m. So this is a slightly less symmetric formula, but this is the proper way to do it. Uh, I prefer this kind of convention because then you just add something for positive mass, subtract something for negative mass, and it's just easier to keep track of the formulas, and the formulas come out a bit nicer. But yeah, so this convention appears like in many, many papers, and the same complaint that you just raised is raised every time people read these papers or give talks on these papers. And the answer is this. And this has something to do with what's called the eta invariant, this change in convention, uh, but I won't go into that. It will take me too far afield. Hopefully this is more convincing if I... No, no. I mean, it's just a convention of, uh, of how do we deal with integrating out fermions. Uh, this would be exactly the same. I mean, here I chose the parameterization of the classical Lagrangian so that integrating out fermions is symmetric on both sides. I just chose that parameterization. It's just a question of parameterization of the bare couplings. So this kind of classification, so to speak, is just an artifact of my convention. But it's a convenient convention, as you would see, because the formulas that I'll get will be very nice, comparatively speaking. Okay, so now we are ready to analyze these models. And we're ready to try to analyze these models and we'll do it in exactly the same way as we did the, I want to keep that, I can erase that. So I wanna do it in the exact same logic that I used before. So the logic is that we always draw the mass axis and we try to analyze the theory for large mass and small mass. So what happens when the mass of these quarks is very, very large? Of course, then they don't fluctuate. Let's say large and positive. Then they don't fluctuate because the strong interaction scale uh, is much below their mass. And so we can integrate them out. Uh, integrating them out leads to a, an interesting one loop effect, which is this effect. And then we get a topological field theory at long distances and nothing else, okay? Uh, let me be more precise. Integrating out these fermions shifts k, a la this formula. And then at long distances, we just erase the fermions, shift k, uh, and we have a kinetic term. But as I told you, when you have a kinetic term and a churn simons action, the churn simons action dominates at long distances because it has one derivative rather than two derivatives. And so therefore, at very large positive mass, uh, we just got the long distance theory is a topological field theory. It's gapped. And it's, it's gapped and it's a top, given by a topological field theory, which is SUN at level uh, K plus an F over two. SUN at level K plus an F over two. Okay, so the long distance theory is a topological field theory in, in QCD in three dimensions for sufficiently large mass. For sufficiently large negative mass, the story is the same, it's a gapped gapped vacuum, but with a topological field theory, but now it's SUN at level uh, K minus an F over two. Okay, so the big, the big news here is that uh, the theory as a function of the mass must have some phase transition. It just follows from general considerations because this topological field theory and this topological field theories and these topological field theory are not the same. 
Okay, they have a different number of anions, different uh, matrix for fusion, a different matrix for braiding. And so there must be some phase transition. So the big open question is what happens in between that allows for this topological filter to transmute to another topological filter. Now this whole paradigm is called beyond Landau Ginzburg. Uh, you might have heard this word. Let me explain why. So this whole paradigm is called beyond Landau Ginzburg. So ordinarily, phase transitions are between some symmetry breaking phase and some symmetry preserving phase. Like in Ising models, the O2 model, in the uh, abelian Higgs model that we described in particle vortex duality. In all of those examples, the phase transition between, was between a symmetry breaking, symmetry broken phase and the symmetric phase. That's what landau ginzburg theory is all about, that there are these order parameters that have a potential, they get expectation values and you uh, have a phase transition. Here, this is completely different. This is a phase transition of a novel kind uh, that appeared in the literature much more recently and it's not described by landau ginzburg theories. This is a phase transition between two different topological filters. So this is completely beyond uh, the framework of landau ginzburg This is a completely different sort of phase transition. It's a phase transition between one theory of anions and another theory of anions. So the big challenge in the field is, of course, to understand this phase transition. Is it given by conformal field theory? Is there some symmetry breaking? Is there interesting fermion boson duality? like we had in our uh, previous examples, and so on. Are there any questions about it? Good. When the mass is large compared to all the other parameters, sufficiently large. Uh, G and K, K is dimensionless, and G is dimension full. So let's say when the mass is much, much bigger than G, much, much bigger than G times K, much, much bigger than G times N, where N is the rank. So when the mass is sufficiently large, you can always just integrate out the fermions because they are non-dynamical. Okay, so, so how do we proceed to solving this question? This question is generally, of course, very hard. And we have to try to, we have to try to guess the answer and then see if this makes sense. So the first, the first hint is to try to say, okay, there is a topological field theory at very large mass. Let's dualize these topological field theories, okay? We don't dualize the full theory, we just dualize the infrared theory. Uh, and uh, then we get some U something, uh, Chern-Simons uh, topological field theory. And then maybe we'll find uh, a transition which can be written more explicitly between the U sort of description of the same topological field theory. So let's draw the same phase diagram. But now we apply the level rank duality that was here on the blackboard. Let me repeat the level rank duality. I'll just write, it, I'll just write it, record it here. A level rank duality says that SUN level K is the same as UK level minus N for all uh, integer K and N where UK level minus N were defi was defined here. So first we dualize the asymptotic, we call those sometimes asymptotic phases because these are the correct phases at large at positive and negative mass. So first we dualize them uh, to get a, something that might hint at an answer. So, so on this side, we would get UK minus an F over two. <coughs> at level minus N. Okay, at level minus N. At level minus N. Here there is some phase transition that we don't understand. And on the other side, we will get U, K, plus an F over two at level N at level minus n. So we see that uh, the dual, this is not yet a duality. This is just the topological phases, which I, instead of writing the topological phases using an SUN gauge field, I rewrote the topological phases using a U gauge field. So, so far I haven't done anything. But in this description, uh, it might look uh, tempting 
to try to guess a dual description. Because here, instead of the rank or the level of the churn simons theory, sorry, instead of the level of the churn simons theory that's changing, it's the rank of the gauge group that's changing. The, now the question is, do you know of a natural mechanism to turn a U10 gauge group to a U8 gauge group? Do you know of such a natural mechanism? Exactly, Higgsing. Okay, so this looks a little bit like Higgsing. And it's tempting to think about this Higgsing in terms of scalar fields, because the level does not change. I told you that when you integrate out heavy fermions, the level changes, the conductivity jumps. But when you integrate out heavy scalars, not fermions, the level does not jump. So this phenomenon that the conductivity jumps by one, it's particular to fermions. It does not happen for scalar fields. So therefore, it's very tempting to try to write a dual description here using a bosonic theory, which contains uh, scalar fields. Because the rank changes, the level doesn't change, and it looks like Higgsing. So let's write a model that implements this idea. So let's write Lagrangian. Um, I'll write the Lagrangian here. So the, let's write a Lagrangian that implements the idea. So it's a new Lagrangian. Let's denote it by L hat for completely different degrees of freedom, completely different gauge theory. But its virtue is that it would give the right phases at large mass. So the new Lagrangian is written with dual variables, as, as, if, as always. So now we have F squared trace 1 over 4 g squared. So this is g hat. It's a different gauge coupling, as before, in the, all our dualities. Then there is a different field strength. Now it's a un type field, u gauge field, rather than an sun gauge field. And we have scalar fields. Uh, there will be an f of them. So we have to sum from 1 to an f. And then we write some potential for the scalar fields. Okay, and then we need to write a churn simons uh, piece for the UN gauge field now. Uh, and we know the level from this story, so we know that the level has to be minus n from this uh, kind of educated guess that we're trying to do. So there will be a minus sign i over n, i n over 4 pi, trace uh, some new gauge field a d a hat plus 2 thirds a hat cube. Now a hat is a u, uh, let's see what it's gotta be. It's gotta be a u, k plus an f over two a gauge field. It's a u, k plus an f over two a gauge field. Now, remember that since if k is, if an f is odd, k is a half integer. So this combination is always an integer. So this formula that I'm writing makes sense. It's a gauge theory with integer rank. That's why it was important to be careful about that half integer business so that I get answers that make sense. So we have a completely different looking theory with a new, completely different gauge uh, group, uh, some potential that I haven't yet specified, and some churn simons term at a completely different level. Now let's specify the potential. The potential uh, is going to be, as always, some new mass times phi squared uh, plus some uh, quartic coupling, where the uh, summation over the i indices is implicit. There are enough of those uh, enough of those scalar fields. Uh, each is in the fundamental representation of the U gauge theory. So I should write it down. The phi are, are in the fundamental representation of the U gauge group, and there are enough of them, as I wrote here. So let's say, uh, for contrast, uh, analyze the phases of this theory as a function of the new parameter. So here this parameter was called m, and here this parameter uh, is gonna be called m hat squared. So this diagram and this diagram are exactly the same. I've just, I, I just did level rank duality. So as a function of m hat squared, we can easily analyze this model using the same ideas as before. 
for huge positive M hat squared, we does just let's see if you can already say it. It's like a machine. It's the same thing every time. At huge positive M hat squared, we just right integrate out the, the scalar fields, um, and that just erases. We just erase the scalar fields, and we get a pure. We get a charge Simons theory. So at huge positive M hat squared, we get exactly this charge Simons theory. So this is good. So this is level minus n. At huge negative m hat squared, we have a Higgs mechanism. The scalar fields condense. And now it's getting more interesting. The scalar fields condense, and therefore they break the gauge symmetry. And we have to be careful to find what, it does, what do they break this gauge symmetry to, right? It's a slightly complicated Higgs mechanism because we have a non-abelian gauge symmetry, we have enough scalars, so let's do it a little carefully. So let's write the scalar fields in a matrix. So this matrix is gonna <clears throat> have uh, columns which are uh, at the size of the gauge group. So this is gonna be an F over two plus K, which is an integer. And this is gonna be an F, uh, which stands for uh, the number of scalar fields. So now these scalar fields need to condense and they might break the gauge symmetry as a result. So here one finds an interesting, an interesting, an interesting distinction uh, whether this column is bigger than this row or this uh, row is bigger than this column. The answer would be actually quite different in these two cases. But the choice that I've made uh, for uh, presenting to you this educated guess for the duality already decided which am I going to use. Because this description, this is a U gauge theory. So if this is negative, it makes no sense. There is no such thing as U gauge theory with a negative rank. So I've already actually made this choice for you, that this whole thing that I'm going to discuss only makes sense for K that is big enough. Namely, only for K that is bigger than F over two. This whole thing that we're discussing only makes sense in this case. And in this case, the columns are necessarily longer than the rows. Do you see that? So we're not, so our first attempt at guessing a dual description does not make any sense if k is small. It only makes sense for large enough k. And you'll see that this is a physical thing. There is indeed completely different behavior for QCD above this number and below this number. So this is like the conformal window in four dimensional QCD. But in three dimensions, you can determine it exactly. Uh, because of this duality guess, it doesn't make sense otherwise. Okay. So the columns are necessarily longer than the rows, and therefore the matrix has to look like a bunch of ones. So since the columns are much lo are longer than the rows, this is the answer, and then you have a bunch of zeros. Okay, and this is an F by an F. So this is an F by an F. So that's how the condensate is gonna look like. So this condensate does not completely break the gauge symmetry because the gauge symmetry acts here. So there is an unbroken gauge symmetry. The unbroken gauge symmetry is an F over two plus K minus an F. So the unbroken gauge symmetry is exactly U and F over two, sorry, UK minus an F over two. You see, that's how it, so it magically works. Uh, and at level minus N, because the churn simons term for the unbroken gauge fields is just induced from the churn simons term for the full gauge symmetry. So the churn simons term for this gauge field is just induced from the original one. So that's why its level stays the same. So we see that this Lagrangian has the exact same asymptotic phases. Furthermore, it has the exact same global symmetry. Indeed, uh, you can rotate the scalars with an SUNF matrix. So we see an SUNF symmetry, exactly like in the fermionic theory. U and baryon is a little more confusing and more interesting. Baryon symmetry was a symmetry here because the gauge symmetry is SU. So the phase of the fermion is not a gauge symmetry, it's an actual global symmetry. But here the group is U, and therefore the phase of the bosons is a gauge, uh, is a gauge phase. It's not an actual, it's not a global symmetry. 
but there is a new U1 that emerges from somewhere else that saves the day. Who sees this additional U1? We've discussed that U1 many times uh, yesterday, so let's see if somebody can guess where, the, where there is an additional U1 that would save the day. Hint, think about the U1, the U1 case. Which, which one? Exactly. So there is a magnetic symmetry. Since the gauge group is UNF rather, so when the gauge group is SUNF, we have a baryonic symmetry. When the gauge group is UNF, we don't have a baryonic symmetry, but we have a magnetic symmetry because the U1 factor has a magnetic, magnetic monopoles. As, I mean, monopole operators and the U1 magnetic or topological symmetry that we discussed at length. So the symmetries of these models do not map in a trivial fashion. It's extremely non-trivial. But since the topological phases are the same and the symmetries are the same, people were compelled to conjecture that the models exactly are the same. So the idea is that these two models are exactly the same and they both flow to a second order phase transition. So, so the idea is that uh, these two models are exactly, they have the same infrared physics and they both flow to a second order phase transition. So let me write this conjecture now in a concrete way. And the mapping between these two theories is extremely non-trivial, much like it was in the particle vortex duality. So the operators map in a non-trivial way, and it's extremely non it's highly non-obvious that this whole thing is true. So let's write it down. This is non-abelian fermion boson duality. Non-abelian boson fermion duality in three dimensions. And the statement is the following. This whole thing, first of all, uh, only makes sense uh, when k is bigger than an f over two. In fact, I took k to be positive without loss of generality, which I even haven't said explicitly. So this whole thing only makes sense for large enough k. For small k, this duality cannot be true. But for large enough k, we see that sun level k with an F fermions in the fundamental this is the same under the appropriate map as U gauge theory at level K plus an F over two at level minus N plus an F scalar fields. Okay. Whereby uh, this uh, shorthand notation, we mean that we write all the Lagrangians with the gauge couplings, and there is a second order transition, and these two second order transitions agree, and there is a map of between these two theories. So, and further, so this is one part of the conjecture, that, this dual, that there is such a duality, and, and this, this, this of course implies that the, well, this conjecture assumes or suggests that the transition is second order in this, in this range. So there is a conformal field theory. How does this mapping work? First of all, on this side of the duality, the symmetry is used SUNF times U1 baryon, much like in QCD in four dimensions. And on this side of the duality, the symmetry is SUNF times U1 magnetic. So what we learn is that the magnetic charge and the baryon charge are swapped under duality. Uh, this is a common and important general phenomenon, that the magnetic charge and the baryon charge are swapped under a Bose Fermi duality. And then there is a complicated map of the operators. You can do much, so psi dagger psi is mapped to phi squared, and so on and so forth. So a similar dictionary like we had yesterday. Hmm? In what? Infrared, yes, it's an infrared duality. Of course, in the ultraviolet, these theories are as different as any two theories can be. They have a completely different number of degrees of freedom um, they cannot be the same at high energies. They are, only, they are only dual at low energies near the second order transition. What is the difference between what is the energy? Well, I haven't, meant, I haven't explained that. Let me explain it since you ask. In this theory, I, I chose, K, is, K was chosen uh, here, but without loss of generality, you can always choose to be K non-negative. Why? 
because the theory with negative k and the theory with positive k are related by swapping the orientation of space-time and flipping the sign of the mass, because that also is odd under swapping the orientation of space-time. So without loss of generality, I can always choose k to be non-negative. I should have said it here. And uh, so therefore, to understand what happens when k is negative, I can always just you know, use my results and plus some redefinitions to answer your question. So you can always choose k to be non-negative. And so I'll remove, since I now added this to the blackboard, I'll remove this uh, absolute value. Okay, so you can parameterize without loss of generality the space of theories by non-negative k, because the rest is related by swapping the orientation of space-time. Yes? Yes. Correct. Well, if you try to compute how many there are, you will see that they doesn't agree. Indeed, these are massive particles, and it's an infrared duality. It's a good comment, uh, but the spectrum of the massive particles in this series does not agree. It's only that the long distance properties of the theories agree. But it's an in, but since if there is a second order point, the long distance properties could be very non-trivial. There could be an interacting CFT. And so there, there is content to the duality despite being, sec, despite being an infrared duality. In condensed matter literature, when people talk about duality, they mean something much more loose, but much more general. This is very, very concrete, but perhaps weaker, because it's only about the infrared. There are, when people say duality in different communities, they, different, they mean slightly different things. In some communities, duality means an all energy duality, like exact duality. In some, it means infrared duality. In some, it means something even more loose. So one has to be careful. But here, there is a concrete mathematical statement or conjecture that it's second order and that near the second order, these two theories are the same. Okay, even though they look uh, very different. Okay, so this is the statement. And now I wanna tell you what do we know about this. There is some evidence towards this statement. It's not uh, there has been a lot of work on trying to establish this is, uh, that this is correct. So let me just uh, review some consistency checks. And the interesting open problem is to go to small k. Intuitively, the smaller the k is, the more, the more strongly coupled the theory is. And, um, and so uh, small k is more challenging. But for k bigger than nf over two, we have uh, some consistency checks of this picture. So let me review those consistency checks. I probably want to keep that, so I'll remove that. So, consistency checks. So, one uh, cute consistency check that doesn't cost any effort is to try to plug some special cases, like you know, n equals one. You can try to plug like uh, funny values, like n equals one, or and try to see if you uh, if we encounter a duality that we've already seen. And indeed, for some special values of n, k, and n f, we can uh, make contact with the duality that I explained yesterday, of a boson that's coupled to a u1 level one gauge field, which is dual to a free fermion. So what are these values that we, where we would make contact with the duality? First, we put n equals one. Second, we put a k equals a half. And third, we put an f equals one. Let's just study the special case. Okay, it's a very, very special case of this general duality. So we get on, we get on the left-hand side SU1. What is SU1? It's empty, right? There is no such thing as SU1. It's an empty group. So, uh, so the left-hand side becomes just a free fermion, which is uncharged because there is no gauge group, just one fermion. And the right-hand side becomes K plus an F over two. This is one. Uh, level N, N is minus one. So we get U1 level minus one plus a boson. Is this familiar? 
Is this duality familiar? That was the topic of yesterday's lecture. Exactly this duality. So we worked out the map and the phases of this theory in great detail. So that's good. We made contact with something that we learned yesterday. Yesterday I chose this, the sign here to be plus one, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the reason that it doesn't matter is that this uh, theory has enhanced time reversal symmetry in the infrared since it's dual to a free fermion. So U1 level minus one plus phi is actually the same as U1 level one plus phi because of an enhanced infrared time reversal symmetry. So this is exactly the duality that we discussed yesterday. So that's good. So we have a nice consistency check at some small values of n. And it's good because now this duality is not disconnected from what we studied yesterday. It's a generalization. It's a non abelian generalization of what we studied yesterday. And okay, now the next consistency check. And next consistency check. Are there any questions about this consistency check? Okay, the next consistency check is a, a certain large n limit. So uh, one interesting observation about this duality is that both sides of the duality behave somewhat naturally if you take n and k to be large at the same time. If you take n to be large but you keep k fixed, then uh, here the rank is large, the level is fixed, but on the other side of the duality, the level would, the level would be large, but the rank would be fixed. And so this, is what, this would be a hard limit to analyze because the, the two sides of the duality look very, very different physically. But if you take both n and k to be large at the same time, on both sides of the duality, both the rank and the level scale together to infinity, okay? So a natural large n limit that was this is to take n to infinity, k to infinity, while keeping k over n fixed. This is sometimes called in the literature a Tooft limit for these theories. It's not the same as the Tooft limit for ordinary QCD, which involves G squared. This is a different the Tooft limit. Um, in which you can analyze the theory. It turns out uh, that in this limit, both sides of the duality are exactly soluble. So both sides are exactly soluble. So these are certain large N models which are exactly soluble and the duality can be proven. The duality can be proven in this limit and furthermore, you can verify that the transitions are second order. And you can compute all the critical exponents. Uh, this uh, line of work is by uh, two collaborations by Aroni, Minwala, and others. So in fact, uh, the one collaboration studied the, the Tooft limit of the fermionic theory, the other studied the Tooft limit of the bosonic theory, and then they checked that they are the same. <clears throat> so this, was, this limit is exactly soluble and it was shown that the duality is correct. So we see two consistency checks. One at small n, small n f, and small k, and the other is at large n and large k. Um, and both consistency checks work, and that's encouraging. So um, for this reason, many people believe that this is correct. There are, many or, there are several other such uh, consistency checks. Um, including some subleading corrections in the around the Tooth limit. Okay, so uh, uh, yes. Good. Yes. So that's like an extra half level of perspective to what we said in the previous lecture. So in, in that one case, it's just explaining the level at the end of the limit. Yes. 
Yes. Okay, I, I don't I don't completely follow, so let's tell me what, just tell me. What do you mean? So we, you want to choose k equals? Nf half. Nf half plus one? Yeah, but this is a perfectly good choice. It's consistent with uh, k plus nf over two being an integer, yes? Now you want me to plug that into this formula? Okay, so you say that the, we have SUN uh, level uh, this, okay? Uh, plus an F fermions, and this is dual to U, uh, that would be an F plus one, U and F plus one, uh, level minus N, uh, plus an F bosons. Yes, and what's wrong with that? No, because like, the problem is that the beginning is actually the type, which is, which is just with the level. Ah, well, okay, okay, I see your point, but. Remember that the decay that appears in these formulas, when I write this duality, when I say U S U N level K, U K level N, what I mean when I say level K, it's a question of convention. It's the K that appears in the ultraviolet Lagrangian. The K that appears at long distances that describes the anions is given by this K shifted by this conductivity effect, the one loop diagram. And if you take that shift into account, you would land on your feet. In fact, this is exactly what I checked when I drew these diagrams here that when you appropriately take into account the shift in the conductivity due to the fermion loops, you get, uh, you, you find consistent results with level rank duality, okay? But indeed, the way to analyze this theory is to try to plug special cases, try to do some computations in some limits. People have been very successful with that. So there are special cases that reduce to what we studied last time. There are special cases that are exactly soluble. And there are more limits of these theories that are under control that have not yet appeared in print and you can run many consistency checks. Yeah. Okay. So in this large and large, this is not okay. In this limit, uh, these theories become exactly dual to Vasiliev gravity, Vasiliev theory, to Vasiliev uh, theory in ADS4. So this duality between bosons and fermions implements a, a, a change of variables in the Vasiliev theories, actually. So it's classical. It's a classical field theory in ADS4. Uh, it's not a classical theory. It's the quantum field theory has uh, some non-trivial anomalous dimensions, but it's a solvable. It's like any other large n vector model. It's a, a model that can be solved, but it's non-classical. There are certain operators that receive non-trivial renormalization, but it's computable. Um, I'm trying to think what you mean by classical. Um, so what happens in practice in these models is that the, uh, in the large n, large k limit, the, the Feynman diagrams truncate to a small set of Feynman diagrams that you, you, you can solve by Schringer Dyson equation. So in the simplest case, which is uh, this theory, this bosonic theory, in the large n, large k limit, uh, it turns out that the diagrams look like uh, what people call sausage diagrams. So all the diagrams look essentially like this. And because they have this nice uh, sort of recursive structure, you can just solve them by a recursion relation. So you can just sum over all these diagrams and find the exact answer. So it's not classical in this sense, but it's of course classical in another sense, which is that it can be described by free fields in ADS4. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I, that's the, that, I think that's one of the main goals of the conformal bootstrap, to make contact with QCD3 and QCD4, but uh, it's not within reach now. I mean, it might take some time. You can compute the critical exponents analytically in that limit, and you can do a systematic expansion in one over n or one over k, and there's a ton of work on that. This is analytical work, not bootstrap.
<clears throat> I believe that this must be technical reasons. I, I don't know. Pedro might know. I don't exactly know why this wasn't done uh, within the bootstrap. It might be just technically hard. I don't know. You know? Yeah, so Pedro is basically saying that, uh, just saying that the symmetries are SU and F times U1. Typically in the bootstrap, you assume what are the symmetries of the model and what are the low-lying operators. However, in this class of models, the low-lying operator is essentially this psi dagger psi. It's the mass deformation. And the symmetry doesn't depend on N on K. The symmetry is just SU and F times U1 magnetic or U1 baryon. And it doesn't depend on N and K. So there is a big class of possible solution to the bootstrap equations and you try to have, you have to somehow fish them out. It's not clear that they would sit on the boundary of any, of any uh, standard bootstrap lot. So it's not an obvious exercise, I presume. But it's something that, of course, <laughs> the bootstrap community is aiming at. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, what you're saying is more pertinent to matrix models, like uh, super young, maximally supersymmetric Young mills. In vector models, there is a similar thing. There is a class of single trace operators, double trace operators, and the single trace operators nearly factorize and so on. Yeah. So there is. It's a. It's a standard large end vector-like limit. Yeah. Yes. Ah, this is a fun fa I can tell you from general arguments or I can tell you from, well, the technical answer is that there is this diagram for the fermions which shifts the level. Now for bosons, you can repeat this computation and it doesn't shift the level, okay. Now this is not a very illuminating answer, so let me give you a better answer that comes from symmetries. Uh, and then uh, perhaps this answer would be more convincing. Uh, so the more conceptual answer is that um, <clears throat> The parameter k is formally odd time under time reversal. So this, this parameter is odd under time reversal. The parameter of the fermion mass, so you remember that our formula was, the, our formula was that k is shifted to k plus the sign of the mass up to some factors. So this, the idea is that this formula has to be covariant with time reversal symmetry. Now, the mass term for fermions breaks time reversal symmetry. So M is also odd under T. Why is that true? Fermions in three dimensions, if they have positive mass, they have spin a half, and if they have negative mass, they have spin minus a half. And the spin is odd under time reversal symmetry. So flipping the sign of the fermion mass in three dimensions is uh, the same as uh, changing the orientation of space-time. Or more precisely, changing the orientation of space-time flips the mass of the fermion. So therefore, this formula makes sense with what with time reversal symmetry because this and this and this are all odd time reversal symmetry. However, the mass of a boson is obviously even under change of orientation, and so there couldn't have been such a formula. And you can ex exclude higher loop corrections in the same way that I did with the fermions because higher loop corrections could not be consistent with the k of the infrared theory being an integral number, an integer number. So for bosons, you can just use symmetries plus uh, to exclude one loop corrections and integrality to exclude higher loop corrections. Okay, and more technically, you can see in the papers of Coleman and Hill that they've uh, they perhaps say that for bosons it, it vanishes. It's not a hard computation. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are. This is the non-abelian generalization of particle vortex duality. It has the interesting consistency checks and it would be nice to find more consistency checks. Um, there are interesting variations of this model for supersymmetry and so on. Now I want to make a few comments about uh, the small k limit. So what happens if k is small? So what happens And that, I just want to make this comment, uh, put it out there, and, um, and then we'll finish. So what happens if K is, uh, well, by no loss of generality, non-negative, 
but smaller than f over two. Okay, so this is an interesting question for a, a three for two reasons. The first reason is that this includes the special case where k vanishes. The case, special case of vanishing k is the most easily accessible case for lattice practitioners because in that case, they don't need to put the churn Simon section. And lattice people do not know how to put the churn Simon section at the moment. So this is accessible by lattice people. So this duality is not accessible by lattice people because it pertains to non-zero k. But for zero k, we can hope that the lattice people can settle the answer. Another, well, another motivation is that for Uh, in some limits, it's been established. So we don't know, there is no mathematical theorem that says that it's second order for all k and f and n in this range, meaning k bigger than f over two. But for large k and n, it has been established. So if you take k equals 100 and n equals 100, it's, sec it's definitely second order. It might fail for k equals five and you know, n equals seven, but for large enough k and n, it's definitely second order, okay. Um, so k equals zero is accessible by the lattice, so it's interesting to address this question. And in fact, you might say that k equals zero is the best analog of four-dimensional QCD. <coughs> Another reason is that small k, small k is like strong coupling. Small k is like strong coupling. And you might expect maybe confinement or some symmetry breaking. Uh, because k is essentially like one over h bar. So you see that k appears in the numerator, so it's like one over h bar, and these dualities pertain to k bigger than something, so you can think about them loosely as being in the conformal window. So these are dualities in the conformal window, uh, very loosely speaking. But small k is more like strong coupling, so you might expect the more exotic phenomena that we're used to from in four dimensions, we're used to from four dimensions, namely confinement, spiral symmetry breaking, uh, but not, no conformality. So this might be interesting for this reason. Another interesting reason to study that limit is of course that duality fails. This duality makes absolutely no sense uh, when uh, k is small. The way it's written here, it's not, uh, it's not obvious why this duality makes no sense for small k, but I gave you the answer before. This duality makes no sense for small k because this matrix uh, that we wrote would have uh, shorter columns than rows, and therefore the gauge symmetry would be broken in an incorrect fashion. So you would not reproduce the right topological filters. So the duality makes no sense in this case. The duality is incorrect. Okay, so I just want to tell you what's the proposal for this case, and then we finish. This proposal has uh, less consistency checks than the other one because it's more about the strongly coupled regime. But on the other hand, it's accessible by lattice computations. So the lattice people should be able to tell us if this is true. So I'm just going to draw a diagram. This is uh, M. Uh, and so <clears throat> what do we know for sure? We know that at large M, we have SUN, this is always true, SUN uh, level uh, K plus an F over two. And at small M, we have SUN at level uh, K minus an F over two. And the main proposal for this regime is that in the middle, instead of there being a second order phase transition with a dual bosonic theory as before, we have symmetry breaking. But unlike in four dimensions, you remember that I remarked in the beginning that the mass term in three dimensions does not break the global symmetries. So symmetry breaking cannot occur just at one point since the mass deformation is invariant under the symmetry. So the there is a region, a finite window here, let's call this window from here to here, where the symmetry is broken. And this uh, region includes, so to speak, this most strongly coupled point, which is m equals to zero. So the idea is that in this region, S u and f global symmetry is spontaneously broken to S u and f over two plus k. 
times S U N F over two minus K. So one nice thing about this proposal is that it makes no sense for large K. So that's good. Uh, this proposal for symmetry breaking makes sense only for small K because otherwise the second factor here has negative rank. So here there is number Goldstein bosons. And here there are transitions. And these transitions between topological field theory and number Goldstein bosons have dual descriptions. So let me just tell you what they're, I won't explain this part, I'm just giving you a picture uh, of what is the proposal. And you can then run consistency checks at home. So here there is a bosonic dual description. So here there are two transitions. So unlike this story where there is one transition, here there are now two transitions and a symmetry breaking phase. That's the proposal. So this transition has a dual bosonic description, which is a UNF over two plus K level minus N plus NF bosons. And this dual description is, is different. So there is another dual description, but now it's at, uh, it's an F over two minus K, a uh, level minus N plus an F bosons. But these are different bosons. Okay, so let me just make two remarks about it and then I'm done. So at small k, the idea is that there is symmetry breaking. That's the central idea. But this symmetry breaking pattern depends on the chern simons level, so it's a non-trivial conjecture. It's not something that there is an analog for in four dimensions. That's part number one. Part number two is that uh, there are two transitions, but they have different bosonic dual descriptions. So this description is gonna be valid in the infrared around this fixed point, and this infrared duality is gonna be valid around this fixed point. So this exhibits the general idea that infrared dualities are valid near second order transitions. So there is no contradiction to the fact that one fermionic theory has two bosonic dual descriptions because they describe different regions in parameter space. They describe different second order transitions. In fact, this, is very, this kind of picture arose in the 90s in cyborg-Witten theory. So this is best viewed as being analogous to cyborg-Witten theory. Those of you who studied cyborg-Witten theory may remember that there was a, a gauge theory but it had two different descriptions in different points in parameter space. One was uh, using a dion, and the other was using a monopole. And these two different descriptions were mutually non-local, and that was why cyborg witten theory was so rich. Here there is a, a similar story. We have one gauge theory, two second order transitions, but they have different bosonic descriptions which are mutually non-local. So that's the proposal. This proposal, again, passes many consistency checks, not as many as the previous one and we have less evidence that these transitions are second order, but we have some evidence that this number Goldstone boson phase exists, from the lattice, for instance. So this is the current state of the art, and, and so obviously there are many open questions, and so I would like to uh, finish here. Any more questions? Yes. Can you go? Can, can you check the chiral conductivity from that duality? Can you check what? The chiral conductivity that you talked yesterday. Yes, so you can ask what are they? That's a very good question. The question is if I can check if the conductivities here work. That's a very good question. And there was a whole paper that was written about it, exactly about your question and it miraculously works out. So if you compare the conductivities of the bosonic theories, the bosonic theories induce some jumps in the conductivities between the number Goldstone goldstone phase and the TFT. The fermionic theory induces some different jumps. And miraculously, once you sum the jumps, it works out. And people have checked it for the, for the electric conductivity and for the gravitational heat conductivity. There is also some kind of chiral heat conductivity. So there is a whole paper about it of, by uh, Poshen and Cyberg and perhaps somebody else, and this works out miraculously. So this is one of the non-trivial consistency checks of this business. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
For QCD? No, so, for, 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 three for three dimensional QFT. So, three dimensional QFT uh, appears most naturally in uh, several areas. <clears throat> I'll tell you three places where three dimensional QFT appears very naturally. Well, for, first of all, the study of QCD in diverse dimensions has a long history because QCD in lower dimensions is typically easier and it gives you some interesting insight into four-dimensional QCD, which is what we maybe ultimately are interested in. So three-dimensional QCD here, you saw that while it has an additional parameter, K, uh, it admits a boson fermion duality, which is something that four-dimensional QCD maybe does not admit. Okay, maybe it does, but we don't know. So it's simpler, so we can learn something. That's uh, one general historical fact, but more concretely, uh, three-dimensional filters appear in uh, three main areas. As far as I know, there may, you know, there might be others. One area is what's called quantum phase transitions. So what you take, you take a bunch of spins in two dimensions, which is a very common condensed matter setup, like an antiferromagnet. For example, you, you take, people usually take a quantum antiferromagnet uh, in uh, antiferromagnet in two space dimensions, in two space dimensions. Uh, and then there is a Hamiltonian for this antiferromagnet and they change some parameters. And so sometimes there is a quantum phase transition, meaning that there is a phase transition as a function of some couplings at zero temperature. And these phase transitions are described by some uh, conformal field theories in two, two plus one dimensions. And, near this the, and there is a huge literature on various such quantum phase transitions that are described by gauge theories in two plus one dimensions. So gauge, gauge theories in two plus one dimensions appear very naturally in condensed matter constructions they find SU gauge theories or U gauge theories with fermions or bosons. One very famous case is the Neil VBS transition, which I actually explained in a lot of detail in this precise room a year ago. Um, so that's one natural way to get it uh, from quantum phase transitions. You can read about it on the internet. Uh, the second uh, place where this uh, appears very naturally is at finite temperature, Young Mills. Uh, so as you may know, uh, turning on finite temperature in quantum field theory is the same as putting the theory in a circle. Do you know this idea? No. So there is, uh, the idea is that finite temperature in quantum field theory is the same as quantum field theory in a circle. So you just take one space and compactify it. And then you have a, a field theory in one lower dimension. So to study finite temperature uh, quantum field theory, you end up uh, studying a two plus one dimensional QCD. If you want to understand finite temperature effects in uh, QCD, you end up studying some questions in three-dimensional QCD. The third topic is in domain walls. So there are various defects in four-dimensional theories which look, uh, which have one dimension less. Uh, you might remember that in my first lecture, yeah, in the first lecture, we discussed such a domain wall between two vacua when there was symmetry breaking. So if you take quantum, chromodynamics in uh, three plus one dimensions, and you take the mass of the quarks to be negative, which is the case that I did not discuss in these lectures, there is a domain wall. And the physics on that domain wall is described by exactly this model. Exactly this model with some value of k. There's a huge literature about that now. Well, there is a substantial literature about that. On uh, the construction of QCD in two plus one dimensions on domain walls in four dimensions. The final thing is that three-dimensional quantum field is dual to four-dimensional quantum gravity. So 3D QFT is dual to 4D quantum gravity by Maldusena's duality, okay? And four-dimensional quantum gravity is perhaps something that everybody is interested in for the obvious reasons. Uh, so this, in particular, this Vasiliev theory is like a de degenerate case. The, the Vasiliev theory in ADS4 that I mentioned here is like a degenerate case of four-dimensional quantum gravity. So these are some motivations. Uh, me personally, I, most, I was most uh, interested in this business and in this business so far, but there are many other aspects of this story. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yes. One or two, yeah.
uh, not the ADS-CFT duality, but uh, in the Vasiliev theory, what happens is that uh, if you take the large n, large k limit of this duality, then at the fixed point, they are dual to Vasiliev theory. But you can explore away from the fixed point. Uh, this, there are known constructions in ADS-CFT. It's no longer ADS-CFT, it's like, like non-ADS, non-CFT. But you can, uh, there are many known constructions where you add the uh, relevant mass perturbations to uh, theories and then the ADS counterpart induces some RG flow. Uh, the first such examples I, appear, I believe appeared maybe by klebanov strassler where you can see that you can extend the ADS-CFT correspondence beyond, uh, beyond conformal field theories. And in the context of a CDF theory, I think that people more or less, while not in detail, they qualitatively know how to add a mass. But it might be technically very hard to implement. I, I don't know if people have tried. I have a question, different kind of question. Can you spec, so it, I mean, the approach looks like Lagrange's and maybe not the best way to describe these theories. Do you have any speculations on what might be a better way? Yeah, the notion of duality shows that Lagrangians are, at least at long distances, the Lagrangian is not. Of course, the Lagrangian is important if you want to have an all-scale description of the theory, but the infrared uh, contains a sort of less information than the Lagrangian. So many different Lagrangians could have the same long distance limit, and that's the notion of duality. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, there are various grandiose ideas that maybe Lagrangians should be dispensed with, and. Uh, quantum field theory has maybe a, you know, a different presentation and we're doing quantum field theory wrong because duality is not manifest. Uh, so there are maybe gr grandiose ideas that we should revolutionize quantum field theory because these dualities show that the old fashioned way of thinking about quantum field theory is redundant. But you don't think any is more promising than anything? Well, I'm just, <laughs> uh, we, we just do what we can. These are some grandiose ideas that are that one may be motivated by, but I wouldn't know what to do with them concretely. Yeah. It's correct actually to say that all the dualities that we see in the slag trees are changing equations of motion to constraints and vice versa? Or there's an exception? Um, Mm. Mm. Um. Well, this is quite a general fact here. So the fact that the baryon symmetry is swapped with the magnetic symmetry uh, is an example of what you said, because the conservation of the magnetic symmetry on the bosonic side of the duality is a Bianca identity. So you can think about it as a constraint rather than while in the bosonic side, uh, on the fermionic side, the ion baryon is, is conserved because of the equations of motion. Okay? Now, but this is a very, very Lagrangian thing. Yes. Uh, the more correct way along the lines that Nathan suggested to think about it is that this whole distinction between equations of motion and constraints is artificial. Right. And the whole point, and, and moreover, gauge symmetry is artificial. Because you see that this duality involves theories with completely different gauge groups. You see? And completely different metric content. So one lesson to draw from this is that constraints versus equations of motion is an artificial distinction. Gauge symmetry is an artificial thing. And Lagrangians are a redundant thing. Okay? That's what there is is more like, a, you know, some universal fixed points and some deformation space and maybe some classical limits. And, uh, and that's it. Okay, so up. So a, a good direction to try to find a formulation where dualities are manifest was treating equations of motion constraints in equal footing, something like that? Yeah, that, that, uh, oh, the wrong. <laughs> that approach is extremely limited. Uh, I mean, with that approach, you can uh, prove some quadratic dualities. Like uh, there is this fact that uh, free photons are the same as free number Goldson bosons. Yeah. And there, this is like an example where one side is a constraint, the other side is an equation of motion, and everybody's happy, okay? Uh, but I think that this kind of Lagrangian approach has proven to be uh, not powerful enough, yeah. unfortunately. Right. So, moreover, in generalizations of these dualities to orthogonal gauge groups, what you find instead of the baryon symmetry being exchanged with the magnetic symmetry, what you find is that uh, 
the magnetic symmetry is exchanged with charge conjugation. And on both sides, uh, the symmetries are Z2. So there is no fundamental distinction, it appears, between constraints and equations of motion. These are just artificial distinctions that are imposed by the Lagrangian formulation of quantum field theory. And if you find a better way to do it, that would be extremely valuable. But nobody has, the way people find dualities is by guesswork and by consistency checks. There is no manifestly duality covariant formalism of quantum field theory. <coughs> Any other question? Okay. Okay. Okay.
People know who Hector Parra is? Hector Parra? Anybody know who he is? No. Ah, Ivan is there. Ivan Borbano. Ah, Johan. What about um, Johan Hernandez Ibaja? Okay, so I'm missing two. Okay, so if they don't show up, then we can. I don't. The one who was waiting was Aki. That's what I seem to remember. But you don't remember? I saw his. Uh, yeah, it, there is somebody from Hong Kong. So we'll have the exercises first. And then so this guy Ali. Aki from Hong Kong. I think I know what he looks like. But, um, Oké, okay. uh, passengers uh, Para en Ibarra, please contact the information desk. You are supposed to give a talk, but uh, your uh, files are not yet in the computer. So, are they here? last call for passengers Para en Ibarra. No? Oké, okay. well, okay. time out. You may lose your slot.
Who wants to start? So if you don't start, then I'm uh, take you to the blackboard. Okay. <laughs> this is dangerous. Okay. Right. Okay. No, no, no. The first one is uh, not related to the exercises. Uh, it's maybe very simple the answer. You, you, last class you were talking about uh, positive decay parameters in the theory, in some level, mm -hmm. which is also related to continuity in the mm -hmm. And we were talking about positive k, negative k. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Talking about uh, theories being different. But yes. when I started in my quantum mechanics basic class, I uh, have a, the angular momentum. I see what the spin has. I try to compute j. j goes, it's like zero, one half, one. And I've never considered something like a negative spin theory. So uh, is my, does my question make any sense? Or yeah, is it a the, what you were talking about is the Casimir yeah. of SU2. But the, this Wait, spin a is different. Just a second. You're talking oh. about the Casimir of SU2. Yes. That is a positive definite object. OK. What I'm talking about is this. In quantum field theory, uh, in D space, the D, D minus 1 space dimension, and one time. So suppose you have quantum field theory in D minus 1 space, and one time. OK. Then you can ask, what are the representations under which particles transform? OK. Namely, what is the little group? So the little group is uh, SLD minus 1. And there are particles transform under SLD minus 1. More precisely, it's the universal cover of SLD minus 1, uh, which is called spin D minus 1. When you put D equals uh, 3 in this formula, which is what I'm doing, you find that the little group is SL2. The universal cover of SL2 is a R. So the spin of particles in two plus one dimensional quantum field theories is a real number. This is why we can get any ions. I'm not talking about the Casimir of SU2. I'm talking about the eigenvalue of the spin generator, which is SL2, in a two plus one dimensions. And that can be a, any real number because okay. we have to consider the universal cover of SL2. So in general, you, you should get a real number, but for these theories, because of topology, k must be integer. integer. So, th th I mean, the, there's a restriction on k, but it doesn't k come from k has nothing there. to do with that. k is the coefficient of the churn. Uh, there, there is the question of what are the spins uh -huh. of possible particles or any ions. This can be any real number. Then there is another question, which is what are the allowed k coefficients in, in front of churn Simon's terms. This is only an integer. Now, going back to the discussion of the vortexes, uh, okay, we, we, could, uh, we could only uh, differentiate yes. model one. So yes. at the end in of the In the case day, of a vortex in the abelian Higgs model, the spin of the vortex uh, when k is equal to one is either a half or minus a half. Okay. But if you study the, if you study the magnetic vortex in the abelian Higgs model, with the coefficient k, the spin of the vortex would be one over two k. Okay. So it can be any real, any rational number in this class of theories. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other question. Uh, uh, is it okay? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's okay for me. Okay. Um, the other question was related to one of the first exercises, <coughs> uh, in which we had, uh, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, we have like a cinematic theory, something. Probably like this. Uh, I only I only remember the cosine interaction term. It's not. It was cosine, not cosine squared. Cosine. Okay. And we had this this term. I don't recall the, the complete exercise, but we we should try to reproduce this configuration where we have here like a charged particle and that field. It's like zero everywhere. And here, like zero mod two pi. Come again? 
zero mod two pi. I, 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 modulo two pi, zero modulo yeah, two pi. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. And well, it should be non-trivial somewhere yeah. around here. Yes. And I just thought of a solution which could be. It, it's it's still constant everywhere. I, outside here, just it's phi equals zero. Yeah. Uh, and then here, for phi. Equals when you drop if there's no cinematics here this dies so I try to solve this not zero minimize you minimize the cosine so that gives you a sign with respect to phi well well I don't know but well, it's better to minimize minus cosine it's the most convenient choice put okay. minus cosine and then the minimum would be at phi equals zero mod two phi mod yes. two phi yeah okay so can the configuration be phi of zero equals zero? Yeah. And then phi of pi, phi of two pi equal pi. What or is something zero like that. Pi? I don't understand this notation. These are coordinates in space? Yeah, coordinates in space. The, the argument of phi is the angle, it's the theta angle. Uh, and how do you measure these angles? Come again? How do you measure these angles? No, I, to the I, I, I got lost there. I, I, I didn't go any further. I, I just thought about it. That's why I wanted to ask it you outside of this, but it's no problem. Well, far away from the defect, there is a symmetry in the, with respect to translations in X. Uh -huh. So it's better to parameterize the space by Cartesian coordinates rather oh. than polar coordinates. Okay. Okay. So Beatrix, right? So she presented the solution okay. uh, yesterday. She can give you the solution. She has okay. it written up, maybe. Can you? Oh, sorry. Come again? Yeah, she showed how to solve it yesterday. So oh. sure, you can you can get the oh, solution okay. from her. Yeah. yeah. So just ask her, and yes. she'll give you the solution. Okay. Yes. Okay. You can go. Okay. What's the idea? Uh, you ask it to calculate the spin of this operator, uh, one, I guess. Uh, here. You ask it to calculate the spin of this operator. Yes. My, the idea that I got was that using the, the operator map that we found yesterday, we can map this object to this. Yep. And we know the spin of this object. Yes. It's minus one half because yes. we are in the phase of yes. negative mass. Yes. Is this the way to solve it? Well, this is a. This is assuming the duality. Yes. But what we want to do is to compute the spin independently of the duality and then check if this formula makes sense. Oh. So there is another way to solve this exercise, which is that uh, there is an old result by Schwinger, and maybe even by Dirac, that if you have a magnetic monopole. There is this uh, computation I'll show you that. I mean, the best way to solve this exercise is, uh, is uh, to recall some uh, uh, fact that uh, was uh, appears. OK, let me just. <clears throat> so there is this uh, paper by Wu and Yang. And uh, I, I was told that this was also known to Schwinger and maybe even to Dirac. So the, they, they solve the problem. The following problem is the problem in classical differential equations, which is the, I'll explain the relation to this in a second. So you have S2 and you have a monopole uh, with one unit of magnetic charge. So now you, you remember the spherical harmonics, right? They are the spherical harmonics that you study in school. But if there is a magnetic monopole, then the spherical harmonics get modified. So there is an index, they acquire an additional index, uh, which is the strength of the magnetic monopole. So let's say we put g equals zero. These are the ordinary spherical harmonics. But if you put g equals one, they're called the monopole spherical harmonics. So you can find them in Wikipedia. They're called monopole spherical harmonics. And people have, I mean, the exact form of this uh, spherical harmonics is of course known. Now, a fact that was, uh, I mean, I learned it from Wen Yang, but uh, 
apparently it was already known to Dirac. Uh, so an important fact is that the ground state, so remember that the G equals zero, the ground state spherical harmonic has zero L and zero M. So the ground state it is an S wave, okay? Like in the hydrogen atom. But if you put G equals to one, the ground state has a spin a half. And this is a very surprising fact. What it means is that if you have a magnetic monopole and you have a, some boson that uh, orbits this magnetic monopole, the total angular momentum is a half integer. So two bosons can make a fermion. A magnetic monopole with an electric boson orbiting around it make a monopole. They make a fermion. So this is like a, a silly example of a fermion boson duality, fermion boson correspondence. So we have boson monopole. Let me write it down. Boson monopole plus boson electric charge. If you look at the ground state of this model, you get a fermion. Okay? This is also explained in this paper of uh, Alfred Goldhaber that I referred to yesterday. So this is an extremely surprising fact. Um, does anybody know why this is true? Maybe somebody in the audience knows this fact. It's a classical fact from the 50s. Do you know why this is, how this is possible? That a boson, magnet, ma boson magnetic monopole and a boson electric charge can make a fermion? Does anybody know this fact? So they, 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 this is because of the following. So there is a nice classical understanding of why this is true. So suppose you have a monopole. A monopole radiates magnetic fields, right? So the magnetic field that uh, the monopole emits is one over the distance uh, squared, and there is G here. G is the strength of the magnetic monopole, okay? Now suppose you put an electric charge somewhere here. The electric charge emits electric fields. So the total angular momentum of the system consists of the angular our orbital angular momentum. The total angular momentum of the system, L, consists of the orbital, argu ar orbital arg angular momentum plus the spins of the particles. And we assume that this is zero. We assume that this is a spinless object and this is a spinless object. And we can even assume that it's in the S wave. But there is another contribution to the angular momentum from where? Exactly. Very good. From the integral of x cross e cross b. Or maybe it's x dot. I forgot. How does it work? x dot. That's the angular momentum of the electromagnetic field. And presumably already Dirac, but definitely Schwinger and then Wu and Yang have computed it. And this comes out to be a half. Sorry, this comes out to be the product of m and e. This comes out to be the product of m and e over two. Okay? So if the, you have a unit magnetic monopole and a unit, ele unit electric charge, you get a half. So that's why two bosons can make a fermion. It's because of the angular momentum that is stored in the electromagnetic field. So the best way to solve this exercise uh, of computing the uh, spin, where was that? Where? Ah, yeah. The best way to compute the spin of this thing is to realize that in a radial quantization, which is what you started doing, this is just a magnetic monopole, and this is an electric charge that's orbiting the sphere. And therefore, the wave functions are described by this, and that's how you get the spin. Yeah, yeah. Why did mine do Okay. Then there is a... <coughs> there is no... There is, there is no minus there. Let me explain this minus. We're confusing again to the, we're confusing the little group. Let me explain this general fact. So suppose you have quantum filter in, on Rd minus one times time. So we, we have particles, okay? Particles are a Minkowskian object that needs a, a Hilbert space interpretation. Particles sit in representations of the universal cover of SOD minus one, okay? 
particles. Uh, now, the universal cover of SLD minus 1 for d equals 3 is uh, R. So particles can have any spin, and spin a half and minus a half is not the same. Okay? However, local operators are not classified by this thing. Local operators preserve a bigger little group because local operators are not, are, are just local in space time. So local operators, they transform under the universal cover of uh, SLD, not SLD minus 1. So when we classify the quantum numbers of local operators, we use SO3, or more precisely, it's universal cover. Sorry, it's double cover, which is SU2, which is also its universal cover. So we use SO3D, which is SO3, but then we need to take the universal cover and we get SU2. So when we study, when we try to map the local operators across duality, we do not use the spin of the particles. We use SU2. And under SU2, this is in a doublet, and this is in a doublet. There is no sign. The Casimir is a, the Casimir is a, is a, the spin is a half. J is a half. There is no sign in this business. So here J is a half, and here J is a half. Then what you do is you act with these operators on the vacuum, and then you get particles. And depending on the sign of the mass, you get in one, on one side plus a half, and on the other side minus a half. So the minus sign is a Hilbert space thing. And the uh, local operators don't have that minus sign. Okay. So to compute the spin of this operator, M uh, phi dagger, we use this. And we use this idea about the uh, Wu-Yang monopole wave functions. Any other questions? Yeah. Maybe you should take a microphone and come here because I can't, I didn't parse the question. I was wondering if it's possible for us to have topological phase transitions in these models we were discussing today. I mean, I'm not from the field, but I was curious. What is a topological phase transition? <laughs> I really, uh, I was expecting you to explain me <laughs> because it was my next, <laughs> next request. So I have to find the question for which the answer is yes. Or? No, uh, I just wanted you to explain me if it is possible in these models, and in simple, in a simple way, explain me what is, what is a topological phase transition. I don't know what is a topological phase transition. Okay then. Maybe somebody knows. Uh, no, I, I just don't know. I mean, you you have to try to sharpen the question. Is the, yeah, you mean something like the cluster is Dowdless transition? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, do you mean yes, something like yes, cluster? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, what is topological about it? In what sense do you think it's topological? I don't know. That's the, <laughs> the main point why I'm here. Yeah, yeah. That's what I explained, that mm -hmm. these transitions are beyond landau gisborg mm -hmm. because there is no local order parameter that jumps. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, all these phase transitions that happen in three-dimensional QCD, mm -hmm. uh, they are topological in one precise uh, sense, which is that there is no local order parameter that jumps. Okay. Ordinarily, uh, phase transitions in statistical mechanics mm -hmm. uh, were viewed always or thought to be always phase transitions where there is some local order parameter that jumps. But in the phase transitions that we're describing here, 
uh, there is no local order parameter that jumps. Okay. What jumps is the set of anions. Mm -hmm. So the set of anions and their braiding and fusion rules. So it's a completely different thing. So in this sense, these uh, models are called the, in this sense, these phase transitions are called the beyond Landau Ginzburg. Okay. Because what jumps is some topological data about the anions rather than some local order parameter. So there is no local measurement that you can do on the lattice or on the computer that would show this phase transition. You could, of course, simulate the phase, you could simulate the model for arbitrary mass and then find that there is some special point where the model becomes massless and you have some uh, critical exponents, blah, blah. But you would not have any local order parameter, strictly speaking, jumps. Okay. Okay, thanks. No. Yes. Okay, so the question is, why is it so hard to simulate the trend time on section on the lattice? Maybe you, maybe you know the answer? He is asking, why is it so hard to simulate these models on the lattice? Even in the massive phase, it's very hard. No, even in the massive phase, it's very hard. Yeah. No, no, but even in the massive phases, nobody can simulate these models. Well, the, the answer that I, people tell me, who, the people who do lattice simulations, um, the point is that people on the lattice never do Minkowski signature. They always do Euclidean signature, okay? So in Euclidean signature, uh, the action is like F squared plus I A D A plus A cubed and then there is some K and four pi and then fermions. Okay, this is the kind of action on the, oh, no. It's a, a notoriously hard to deal with fermions, but that problem has been overcome with the work of, on the fermion domain walls. People know how to deal with fermions, so that's not the issue. The issue is this I. Because the action is non-real, the full answer is, of course, real. This model is unitary and to base CPT theorem. So the partition function and the free energy are real. Why? Uh, well, in Euclidean signature, the action is allowed to be complex if and only if under complex conjugation and reversal of the orientation of space and time, the action goes back to itself. That's how the CPT theorem looks like in Euclidean signature, that the action has to be invariant under joint complex conjugation and reversal of orientation. So in Euclidean signature, every term that has an epsilon tensor must come with an I, because then complex conjugation and reversal of a space-time orientation take the action to itself. So there must be an I in Euclidean signature when we write the Chern Simons action. But that means that the action is not real. And furthermore, that means that uh, when you do Monte Carlo, you'll get signs. So that's what's called the sign problem. You know about the sign problem? Did you hear about the sign problem? So it's very hard to do Monte Carlo if you if your action does not have positive definite signs, right? Yes. So I think that's the issue. That the the answer might be very small, but each contribution is very large. And then you need like huge numerical precision to fish out the right answer if you have fluctuations. If everything is positive and you sample enough of the parameter space, then you're in good shape. But if a, there are uh, signs, you might not be able to fish out the answer. So that's one difficulty, that there, that, that there is a sign problem. Another difficulty is you have to write the turn simons coupling somehow on the lattice. This can be done, but it's kind of nasty. You have to, you have to actually write like some kind of uh, action that mimics the turn simons action on the lattice. Okay, is this more or less? So uh, as far as I know, the issue is the sign problem. Well, lattice people do simulations in Euclidean space. That's, uh, there are several kinds of lattice communities. There is the lattice community that does the Wilsonian lattice, and they always do Euclidean space, Spa Euclidean, Euclidean stuff. But then there is the condensed matter people who simulate uh, using uh, tensor networks, uh, 
and other techniques, DMRG, they simulate the real, real time physics and they simulate Hamiltonians. They, just look for, they, they look for the wave functions of the ground state. And for them, uh, first of all, they don't need Euclidean signature. And second of all, they don't care about signs. They can perfectly well simulate uh, systems where there are sign problems, uh, like quantum antiferromagnets. So in my opinion, this is probably how it's gonna unfold, that uh, these people will be able to write uh, quantum antiferromagnet models that uh, mimic SU engage theories at level K with fermions, and they will be able to get it using tensor network. I mean, that's my opinion. The Euclidean lattice method uh, seems, I mean, nobody has been able to solve the sign problem in 30 years, so it seems uh, very hard indeed. I mean, I may, I may be misrepresenting the, no. Yeah, so. This, this problem is the first time in OSS Erasmus, where he basically attempts to do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, basically, he takes the first thing that I'm in front of the same thing, you use random numbers, and you have to get two big numbers because they have an eternity because of the random numbers. Uh, the first one, I think, they spent a big morning doing the exercise that. Unless you can find some saddle point or so around which you can prefer. But that basically means that you, you reduce everything to the real case of it. Yeah, one approach in the Wilsonian lattice community has been to try to find a way to group the Monte Carlo configuration space in such a way that uh, for, each for each set of configurations, you know that you get a positive number. Just regroup the configuration space. You know, if, but nobody was able to do it like in practice. However, if you look at the literature of the condensed matter people that do DMRG and tensor networks, you will find that they were able already to simulate interesting models with sign problems in one plus one and two plus one dimensions. In addition, there is the Hamiltonian truncation community, which is more tied to the bootstrap community, and they're also not afraid of the sign problem. So they, you know, they, they tackle head-on uh, field theories with sign problems. So I believe that the I believe that uh, these people will be eventually able to do it. I hope so, yeah. The sign problem is very important for lots of other things that are more down to earth. Like if you wanna simulate what QCD does in a neutron star, you are hit with a severe sign problem. So the, that's why the lattice people were not able to predict the equation of state of a neutron star. And so, you know. Uh, trying to develop methods to overcome the sign problem will be a very valuable thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You're familiar with that fact, or not familiar? Correct. Yeah. Yes. yes, it's exactly like that. Uh, one paper, if you are familiar with the basic idea, you might enjoy reading the classic paper on the subject by uh, uh, Gross and Cesarski. Cesarski. Uh, where they basically studied the high temperature limit of young mills theory, and they've shown that it reduces to young mills theory in three dimensions. Uh, but then uh, there was a lot of work on that in the recent uh, 10 to 15 years, mostly by uh, people such as Mithat Unsel, who extended this uh, story way beyond its original uh, regime of validity. And he studied, I mean, he found very interesting 3D models that arise from finite temperature compactifications of young mills theory. There is also a lot of recent work by Sherman and others. So this is a very, this is a rather active uh, field with many new developments. Oh no, by now they, these people have extended it to 
uh, QCD to young mills with the adjoint fermions to even young mills with theta terms. They were even able to incorporate the theta term and it's a very rich and rather lively field. There were some recent developments that made this whole thing uh, come alive again. And, uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, well, I can say a few words about it. Um, the question is about the gravitational trend Simons term. So the ordinary trend Simons term has to do with the uh, conductivity. You remember the formula that we found yesterday was this? for the response of anions to electric field. So unlike your ordinary intuition, if you apply electric field in the direction X, the current is in the direction Y. That's the whole conductivity. It's called the chiral quantum Hall effect. So chiral conductivity, it's called the chiral conductivity. So the, that's the physical, the, physical, the physical effect, sorry, the order zero physical effect of the turn simons action, that it leads to this kind of uh, uh, unintuitive conductivity. Now for the gravitational trend Simon's term, it leads to heat conductivity in the uh, non-intuitive direction. Uh, by that I mean that if you arrange for a temperature gradient between two points, you might expect the heat will be conducted in this direction, but there is an effect whereby the heat is conducted in an orthogonal direction. So the gravitational trend Simon's term uh, is also very important in many of these dualities because you can ask what is the chiral heat conductivity in each of these phases, and then try to compare the predictions of the bosonic model with the predictions of the fermionic model. And this leads to interesting non-trivial consistency checks. And if you look at the papers about duality from recent years, many of them uh, carry out this kind of consistency checks, and when it works, it's really impressive. It lends a lot of credence to these dualities, because these are non-trivial consistency checks that work for no uh, obvious reason. So it reinforces these conjectures. Yeah. I don't understand which configurations. Can you explain? I don't know what it is. Can you explain? You can come and explain. I don't know what it said, center of words. You take a microphone. Uh, these center vertices that have to do with the center of, uh, of the gauge group. Okay. And and when you take averages of Wilson loop. Yes. With these configurations, they give a contribution that it, that depends on on the linking number between the. the which, link, which number? Linking number. Linking. Yes. The topological invariance between the center vertex word line. Yes. And the Wilson loop. You are doing these uh, computations in 3 plus 1 or 2 plus 1? Two, 2 plus 1, I guess. Two, Say again? 2 plus 1. Yes. So this is kind of the definition of center vortices. They give these kind of contributions. Yes. So I, I, I thought that maybe these kind of configurations might have a, an importance to, <coughs> may, it may have an importance to, to understand the, the phase transitions in. Yeah, so you're very, case. very, very right. This plays, and I now know what you mean by center vortices. What you mean by certain center vortices is what is a, oftentimes nowadays called one form symmetry. You know this terminology? What? what, what, what nowadays terminology? people call these things one form symmetry defects. What you call center vortices is in the literature called one form symmetry defect. One form symmetry charge. 
Okay, why different? Because less people made made computations, and if you take out this kind of configurations in some in some some simulations, you lose confinement. I know. Yes. So one this is called one form symmetry charge, and these configurations exist in many gauge theories and many of the papers on the subject they talk about it. However, in the class of models that I discuss here, they don't play any role because they don't exist. Because in these models, if you look at the models that I studied, uh, like this model and the fermionic model, they're here on the blackboard, the center of the gauge group uh, is not a symmetry because the fermions are charged under it. I assume that you're studying pure Young-Mills, maybe? Yes. So in pure Young-Mills theory, there are no matter fields that are charged under the center. When you, have, uh, when you have propagating particles that are charged under the center of the gauge group, that transform under the center of the gauge group, then there, is no, there are no such defects. These defects are only, appear, only appear in theories where there are no propagating particles that are charged under the center. Okay? And they appear in pure Young-Mills, they appear in Young-Mills with an adjoint fermion. And there are many papers on uh, dualities for adjoint fermions. And in those papers, the defects that you're talking about play a very prominent role. And people analyze them to this. But in the models that I discussed, there are no such defects. But if you look at, this is how this is called nowadays in the literature. So just take a look at this. Thank you. For extra dimension? <laughs> this is like the million dollar question. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Correct. Some special cases here map, map a, a billion to non abelian churn Simon series. That's correct. Fantastic. Yeah. So the, what's your name? Yeah. So you're asking a very interesting question. You're saying that uh, if you look, plug some special cases here, plug, plug some special cases in this duality, on one side you have a billion anions, on the other side non abelian anions. And you're very correct that this leads to difficulties. So, for example, to make your objection, uh, to make your objection um, uh, concrete, we can take uh, k equals a half and f equals one. No. Yeah, k equals a half and f equals one, n equals ten. And then uh, we would be saying that s u ten at level well, let's just end. S U N. S U N at level um, half with the fermion is dual to U1 at level minus N with a boson, right? And you're disturbed by this fact because this has the non abelian anions and this has a billion anions. So this is, a, this is exactly the kind of checks one has to run uh, to get convinced that this thing, that this duality survives. So here there is a magical fact that uh, saves the day, which is that um, if you look at the general SUN level K TQFT, if you look at the general SUN level K topological field theory, then it's K over four pi ADA plus A cubed with two thirds and a trace, okay? And for generic, generic values of integer k, this describes non-abelian anions. But the fact is that for k equals plus minus one, it so happens that this describes <coughs> abelian anions. It's a sparse fact about chern simons theory that SUN at level one happens to describe abelian anions. And then you compute their fusion and mat braiding matrix, and it exactly coincides with the abelian anions of U1 level n. In fact, you could, you could have seen it from level rung duality. I told you that uh, these two theories are the same. Look here. And this was proven, that these two theories are the same. So SUN at level one or minus is the same as U1 at level minus n. So it's 
So SU, SU and uh, topological filters may be accidentally abelian for some values of k. Okay. So this, the, 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 the day, basically what, the, what saves the day is this fact. So it's consistent. Okay. Okay, it's a very good question. Another, any other questions? Oh, I think we're done. Thank you. 